record the session. And uh, yes, so we're going to continue with um, our study in Revelation. And we are looking at chapter 2. I don't think we're going to look at the whole chapter tonight. Well, let's, we'll see how far we get. Um, we're going to look at the the first church and maybe the second one depending on how how much time we have and also um i thought before we begin maybe if there's any question or answers maybe we'll start with the q and a tonight anything questions or, questions or answers okay you can give an answer or you can give a question <laughs> my wife is laughing at me she says <laughs> anyways um Yes, so we'll do that. Maybe if there's any questions from our previous um, studies um, that you still need something to ask, please do it now. Um, and let's see if, if we can answer them. And then, then we'll continue. So if there's any questions from you guys, uh, I see my most active, interactive people online. They're not yet tonight so <laughs> i'm gonna come yeah we're gonna finish very early <laughs> no, i'm just joking okay, any questions any questions please do ask it now uh maybe you have a different approach on chapter one that we did last week maybe something that i didn't think of um you're more than welcome to share that with with us tonight good evening to maria and jose i see you also joined us Okay, as I say, num first, second, third, gone. <laughs> no questions. Hmm? No questions, no questions. Okay, good, good. Doesn't mean you're wrong. <laughs> if we disagree, that's fine. <laughs> We're all trying to learn and uh, grow in our understanding. Um, okay, there is someone joined. Is there no one that has joined? Is there no one Okay, I'm just going to continue. I don't know if, yeah. Okay, let's just continue. Now, let me share my screen again. I've got some slides. Going to do it that way. We are looking at um, the book of Revelation. And just to refresh everyone's minds, uh, I did share this last week, the four ages that uh, we have in Revelation, chapter 1 to 3 mainly about the church um, age, chapter 4 to 19, it's about the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus. Chapter 20, it's about the kingdom age and 21 to 22, the eternal age, which obviously is endless. Now I, I just took this picture again of mine and just added the scriptures. I don't know what is that. Added the, the scriptures here at the bottom um, where I kind of put it now on my diagram. I want to stay consistent. I want to stay, I want to um, contradict myself. So we need to put everything in perspective. So Revelation 2 to 3, this is what we're going to look at. There's the seven churches. And I believe if I can put it on my, on my diagram, it should be there in this uh, church age. And then Revelation 4 to 18, which deals with this time period during the tribulation period. And then verse 19, I put here separately because that's the second coming. That's what I wanted to say there. And I didn't complete my sentence there. It's a second coming of Jesus. Okay, maybe that helps. The second coming of Jesus. There we have it. There. Okay. So that's chapter 19. So just to keep it in that chronological order. And um, we have seen, if I can quickly recap from chapter 1, we have seen that chapter 1 fulf um, uh, fulfills that command of, of uh, verse 19. If you can rem remember uh, chapter 1 verse 19, it says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, uh, that's in the past, and uh, then from chapter 4 to the, let's say 4 to 9, to, to, until the second coming of Jesus, 
that deals with the things that are to take place after this, after obviously Revelation 2 and 3 that talks about things that are, namely the message to the seven churches. And it deals obviously not only specifically with the churches in Asia Minor at that stage, but I do believe it also is applicable to all churches of all ages until today. Um, so yes, and it deals with doctrine and also with Christian living. So my so tonight we're looking at Revelation chapter two, and let me start with the seven churches, so just to give us a, a broader picture of chapter two and chapter three. Now we have seven churches. The first one is that we're going to look at tonight is Ephesus, and we call it the Orthodox but lost love church. I don't know if that's the best way to describe it. Maybe, maybe there's another way to describe it, but it's about the Orthodox, but the lost love church. The second one is Smyrna. We might have some time to look at Smyrna, um, which actually comes from the Greek myrrh, which was a perfume, but we'll go into that. Smyrna, the suffering church. It's about the persecuted church. The, second, the third church is the Pergamum church. And that's the compromising church. Uh, then we have, I don't know how you pronounce that in English, Taitira. Taitira. I don't know if that's correct. It's the tolerant and permissive church. And then number five is Sardis. The church of Sardis is the dead church. And then the number six is the church of Philadelphia, which is the faithful church. And then the last one is Laodicea, the lukewarm, or let's call it the useless church. Okay. Now, although these letters were written to the seven churches of Asia Minor, they are in fact written to the the I believe all churches of all times and all places. It contains messages of encouragement. It contains messages of rebuke and warning and uh, a call to repentance and uh, yeah, calling back to, to where they should be. And uh, many of the problems that the churches faced any other click, Donnie? Many of the, the problems that the church faced, these churches face um, today, well, also today, has to do with negligence of um, Christ's instructions to these seven churches. So if you, if you would, would, would look at the problems and issues that we have in our churches today, you would find that these seven churches that are described in revelation 2 to 3 actually addresses those issues and jesus gave them commands instructions and because the church has problems even in our day today you would find it's because they do not obey christ's instructions in for these seven churches so it's important that we see that that's why i believe it's all applicable to all churches of all ages now now, there, there were other churches during that time, obviously, but these seven churches were selected because they, these particular messages that, they are, that are addressed to them speaks to the spiritual needs of those churches. And at the same time, these messengers, um, messages also addresses the spiritual needs of all churches through all of history and specifically today. Um, the needs, the spiritual need, it addresses those needs. And there, there, there is also a few, um, uh, let me, yeah, few scholars or interpreters that, that says that these seven churches represents the chronologi chronological development of church history in general from the beginning until today. There are some of those that believe that. From Ephesus that happened in the apostolic period in general, in general, and it progresses to the climax that we do find in the Laodicea as the final apostate church before Jesus comes or before the tribulation starts. So 
yes, there, there, that, that, that is not directly stated in the text. So if you go to Revelation 2 to 3, it's not directly said that it represents all of church history as a chronological from Ephesus to Laodicea, but it's rather, it's rather from deduct, uh, rather a deduction from the text and looking at church history that these uh, conclusions are made. Now, there seems to be that remarkable progression that we see in the message, suggesting prophetically the movement of church history. And those who hold to this view, obviously, is the futuristic approach. Remember last week, we looked at the five different approaches. And the last one is the futuristic approach, the one that I adhere to. And um, we do accept that, and I do adopt that view. Uh, from studying other scriptures as well, it is clear for me, if I look at the progression from these seven churches, it is clear for me that things are not going to get better as the church history progress until the end. It's actually going to progress towards apostasy. It's going to get worse. It's going to get bad. Okay. And although the Laodicea, the seventh church, the last one, may represent the modern day church of the last days, there are also trades from the other six churches that you can also find in churches present, in the present in churches today. So you'll also find some of the, the issues that is addressed for at the first and some of the other six churches. You'll find it to also is addressed. You can also apply them today. But in general, we kind of view if Ephesus to Laodicea as this progression, you will find in history of the church also presenting some of the major traits of the church during the church history. Now, the structure of the letters, and I've put it up there. It's interesting if you, if you just do, when you read each letter to the church, it has this kind of structure. Okay. The first one is the commission. The second one is the character of that church. The third, third one is the commendation. Or both. It can be or the commendation or condemnation, or it can be both in the church. So it's, uh, for, for, for example, the church of Smyrna, the second church, they are commended for, for enduring persecution and suffering and those things. And they, we don't really find a condemnation there. But we will find it's either or both of these that you'll find in the letter. Now, and then there's the correction, obviously. And then there's the call and the challenge. So, easy to remember, there are one, two, three, four, five, six C's. Commission, character, commendation, condemnation, correlation, ah, correction, call, and challenge. That's kind of the structure that you find in all of these letters. There are also some similar similarities in all seven of these letters. They all begin with the words, I know your works. Okay, Jesus says, I know your works. And each offers a promise saying to the one who conquers, that's the promise. And each has the same conclusion. He who has an ear, that's the challenge. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so that's kind of the similarities that you find in the seven churches. Okay, so that's just kind of an introduction to the seven churches. Um, I was just thinking about something. Okay, let's just continue. Um, any questions so far? Let me just ask before we continue. Good evening to Cynthia and Alan. I believe... Okay. Um, any questions so far? Hello, Rudy. Sorry we joined late. We had some power troubles here. I, I believe so, yes. Uh, I believe there were powers off there in Hartis. Good. It's good it's to see. I'm very happy. Yeah, <laughs> good. It's on record if you missed the first part. You're more than welcome to watch it again. Okay, so... We will look, let's look at the first church. Now, um, I think even with this first church, there's such a great application for us today. And I want to 
I don't want us to miss the message for us today. So the, the first church is what we call the Church of Ephesus. I don't know what we call it, but the Church of Ephesus, the Orthodox but Lost Love Church. That's just the description. You can describe it in a different way if you want to. The Church of Ephesus, the Orthodox Church, but also the Lost Love Church. And we will we will look at that. So I'm going to start maybe with reading all of the texts. It's from verse 1 to verse 7. From verse 1 to verse 7, I'm going to read all of that. And then we will go into or everything that we learn from this. Now, verse 1 says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lamps. And then verse 2, I know your works. Remember I said similarities between the letters. He says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. Then verse 4, but I have this against you. That's the, so the first one part would be called the com, con, uh, commendation. Com, commendation, commendation, where he commends them for the endurance and for not bearing with falsehood and evil and things like that. Now the second part from verse 4, we find the condemnation part where it says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. I don't know what the new, let's go for me what's here in IV. Verse 4. You have forsaken your first love. Okay, some of the translation says you have forsaken your first love. Now, literally, actually, it says the love you had at first. Now, we'll talk about that. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. That's the command. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet, this you have, you hate the works of the no. Nicolai Lightens, which I also hate. He who has an ear to um, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Interesting portion of scripture. Now, back in chapter 1, verse 13. You remember, and, and if you can rem remember what John saw, he saw the seven lamb stamps, uh, stands. He saw Jesus standing in the midst of the lamb stands, and he was clothed with a robe, a long robe, and a golden sash around his chest, which we spoke about. This is the clothing of a priest or a judge. Now, and those two, those two officers kind of, is also explained, and we spoke about this last week. Jesus, our high priest that intercedes for the church, he's standing in the church, he's interceding for the church, but he's also the judge. And we spoke about the judgment that will begin at the household of God, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And that is what you find in all seven churches Jesus judging the church. Okay, J Jesus in the middle of the midst of the church judging the church and if the church does not um, obey his instruction or his commandment he removes the lampstand that's what's happening now verse 14 says his eyes this is chapter 1 verse 14 his eyes were like flame of fire verse 15 talks about his burnished bronze uh, feet like burnished bronze refined in furnace and we spoke about jesus judging the church by purging the church purifying the church and removing what doesn't belong there. And now the first letter in chapter 2 addressed to, to the angel. Let me see verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. And I, we also spoke about this last week. And I explained that I believe this is not an angelic being he's referring to. It, it's referring to the messenger of the church in Ephesus. And it probably uh, is referring to the the leader of that church or an elder, it might be an pa a pastor um, that he's referring to. That's the, that is verse one, to the angel, the messenger of the church. This is a letter written to him. Um, and uh, Ephesus, 
was the well in, if you look at a little bit about Ephesus Ephesus was a was a very prominent city in Roman in the Roman province of, of Asia Minor at that time and this is <clears throat> also the only church mentioned in the book of Acts if you go to Acts chapter 19 you'll read about Ephesus the church of Ephesus um, if I'm correct Paul planted that church and he ministered in that church if I believe it was three years if I'm correct um, yeah maybe I'm not right but it might be three years and then Timothy let the work um, obviously let the work of as a, uh, after he left as a super intendant of the churches in that area so and this letter obviously john wrote about 30 years later after he was after paul so so you kind of have it the the church of ephesus you have this i would say the second generation uh kind of set up where the believers there were the second generation and he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the words of him who holds the seven stars. Remember Jesus, verse chapter 1, verse 20, holding the seven stars, which is referring to the angels, the seven angels, which we interpret as the leaders or the elders or the pastors, the leaders of those seven churches. Jesus holding them in his right hand, and who talks among the seven gold lamb stands, which is the church, the seven churches. And uh, <clears throat> so Jesus holding, and I think that, that's, that's also a picture of Jesus holding these leaders in his hand. Um, and this place where he holds them is a place of protection. He protects the leaders, but he also, uh, it's also a place of authority. And it echoes what but John, you can you can actually go to John chapter 10, verse 28, 29, where it talks about not no one will pluck you out of my hand, snatch you out of man. It might also be argued about eternal security at this at this point. But um, maybe I'm jumping a bit far from, from the immediate context. But uh, yeah, so I think that's what I see. Jesus holding the leaders in his hands, place of authority, place of place of protection. And then he commends those, this church, the church of Ephesus. He commends them for two things. He commends them for their doctrine and he commends them for their endurance. Okay. They did not bear with evil in the church. They did not bear with sin. They did not bear, obviously, with false doctrine. So I believe they did what John said in his first epistle. They tested the spirits to see if it, these um, are from God or not. And these two characteristics is so important for the church today. It's such a great need, I believe, in the church today. We cannot compromise on these two things. We cannot compromise on moral living. We cannot compromise on sound doctrine. These two things are very important. We must endure with patience. We must bear for his name's sake. And then I, I just looked up another scripture, Galatians 6, verse 9, that says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And, and I, I think that, ex, that kind of describes the church of Ephesus. Those who, they, they did not grow weary in doing good, they did not grow weary in, in keeping the doctrines and, and sound doctrine. So those two things are very important when it comes to the church. Uh, um, so you can say in this regard, the church of Ephesus, they served Christ well, but, but they failed in their lack of devotion. They failed in holding on to the love they had at first. So that's why... I, I said, maybe, I don't know if, if it's going to change, you know, that's verse 4, the meaning of it, because some of the translations says they love, the first love. I think the idea rather is they did not lose their love, but they did not have the love they had at first for Jesus, for, for Christ in the beginning. The love they had for him, it, grow, it grew cold. It, their hearts became Oh, you, their hearts cooled down, if you can say it that way. 
And um, yeah, so it doesn't say they abandoned the love. It says they abandoned the love they had at first. And it doesn't say abandoned faith, which in fact, it can lead to a church that completely abandons the faith. And also, as we see at the end, can be removed from the lampstand stand. So it is not a it, it is not a lack of love or a lack of faith that is that is um, addressed here. It's rather the matter of a heart that was cooling down, their passion that they had for for Jesus in the beginning. Their love wasn't that intense as it was. And uh, Paul actually wrote thirty years earlier, thirty years before Revelation two, he wrote in um, Ephesians. Do I have? Let me see if I've got the scripture here. Ephesians 1. He wrote in Ephesians 1 verse 15 and 16. He said, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So Paul commends them and say, This is a church that that was faithful to Jesus. They loved the people. They loved the saints. They, it was a characteristic of the church. But apparently, 30 years later, that's not the case anymore. Okay? They kind of lost that first, uh, that love they had at, uh, in the beginning. So, although they continued in their faithfulness regarding doctrine, continued in enduring hearts. Yeah, not specifically okay. here, but enduring, ev uh, not bearing with evil and, and moral evil error and more and theological error if you can say it that way although they were they were very strict on those things they lost that kind of passion the, their love for christ was not the same and um and here's the issue when your heart cools off in it turns into spiritual ap apathy if i can use that word and it erases all christian testimony it, 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 it turns into spiritual apathy and it, it erases Christian, um, testimony. your testimony. I just want to see, Aubrey wants to say something. Aubrey, you're more than welcome. Aubrey, did you put your hand up? For it's me to everyone, Pastor Rudy. Okay, let's see. Rudy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Aubrey, you can continue. All right. Rudy, it seems to be some of the conflict that these people had was the fact of um, the silversmiths and the idols uh, where they'd use the silver and of, uh, to do the idols that the production seems to have uh, wavered because of the Christian's statement saying that these idols were not worthy of worship. And also they'd, they'd lost some, um, what is it, support in the fact that when the, when the guys were made Christians, they stopped supporting um, the silversmiths and worshipping Diana. Yeah, that, I, think, I think you could, I didn't go into all of the history, but you are correct. In no, the, there's a lot. Hey? Yeah, yeah, there's so much to, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of speculation around what, and he talks about, and we'll get to that, the Nicolod, what Nicolaitans, Nicolodian. who they, yeah. who, who were they? Because there's no, there's no real history data or facts that we have about that. Although Nico was one of the, one of the um, uh, believers in Acts, but that was 30 years earlier, number one. And some believe they were a sect group, well, obviously, I think there is some some data that explains mm. it was a sect, but exactly what the doctrines mm. were, we don't know. I actually went to see what John MacArthur yeah, says. Yeah. They only give, this is some of the suggestions, but they don't really know. Uh, and, but it is believed that mm. these Nicolaitans, um, they promoted uh, more immoral behavior, if I can use that word, because, yes, that's right. because yeah. in contradiction or in opposition of that, the church didn't bear with that mm. and the church didn't mm. bear with, with false teaching. So obviously, I think those were the two characteristics of the Nicolaitans. 
they were immoral and, and and it can be it can actually be the the gnostics because the gnostics were very um not immoral in their behavior um sinful practices and stuff and also obviously um um, their doctrine was completely off, 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 um, unorthodox, if you can say that. They completely mm -hmm. lost the way. So it might be that. Yeah. It's just maybe, but but they, we can only guess. There's, it's really just a guess. Yeah. Don't really know. So I know they they talk about Diana. That was the that 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 was. Mm -hmm. I would say that was the time when when Paul was involved in the ministry in Ephesus, and not specifically when. Yes. John wrote 30 years later about this. So it might be still the same. I don't know. It's just pure, pure no. speculation at this stage. Yeah. Well, well, I don't know if anyone has... I actually... Hmm. Yeah, you can continue. I actually, sorry. I actually found myself relating this statement to my life today as well and what distracts me in in worshiping the Lord and conducting my life in a way um, that displays my Christianity, if that's the word to use, or my belief in God and what the cross means to me. Yeah. I found that I was applying different things in my life that were hindering me from doing what I knew was correct. Yeah. No, okay, no. Thanks. Very true. I believe yeah. this is applicable to us and we'll maybe at the end maybe of this specific letter to this church, maybe ask a few questions about how does this apply to us and maybe what is the, the dangers and the, the areas that we should look out um, for because I do believe some of these traits can also be, be, be part of a church today and I'll mention them a bit later on. Uh, I just want to see Sarah ask something. Um, what is the lamp stand that he will remove? It's the leader pastor. Then does it mean he will remove those past leaders or whatever? Now, you, you, I think. The menorah. Eh? Yeah, I'll, I've, um, uh, Sarah, I think I'll explain that. I think the lamp stand not necessarily mean um, salvation. I don't want to say that. Uh, yeah. I'll rather say the testimony it had because a lampstand, what was the purpose of the lampstand? The purpose of the lampstand was to shine forth Christ's glory. Christ standing in the midst of the seven lampstands, he's shining bright and the church is supposed to shine that light and the testimony was rather removed. And I'll, I'll explain to you why I'm saying that. Um, so yes, that church obviously probably fell away from what the real definition or the biblical definition of a church should be because a church is the place where Christ's glory must be manifest. And if they're not manifesting that glory, one could argue that the church in general, I'm not talking about individual believers, I'm talking about the church in general, that church probably lost, their, they were removed, they're not testifying about, about Jesus anymore. They kind of became an apostate church, if you can say it that way. Um, so that's that's the that's the danger, and that's the warning that that, that Jesus gives. So let me just quickly continue. Um, we'll please, if you have any questions, hold them. We'll we'll look at them um, also later. I might, I might answer them uh, while we're going through this. But please, you, you're more than welcome to to stop me, interrupt me, and uh, ask your question. Okay, so. Uh, that's that's kind of the thing that that I, I see here is that the church at Ephesus, 30 years earlier, characterized by their love, their faith for Jesus, and their love towards other sin, saints, but it changed. Something changed. They didn't have that same love. Probably the second generation Christian that um, were there, and uh, Jesus said, uh, "Let me just get back to my notes." Um, <clears throat> They, although they were continuing in in not bearing with evil, they were continuing to to hold on to sound doctrine. The issue was their hearts, their passion, their love, kind of um, grew cold. Say good luck again. And and this pattern we can also find in the church history. Um, in the early church, the church were very passionate, loving. But as, the ch as we see church history progressed, we see that the church's love cooled off. 
it was replaced by love for the things of the world and it resulted into compromising and obviously spiritual corruption and then a lot of spiritual corruption came into the church and Paul warns us actually of, of, of some of the th of these things, which is a warning for us as well. And I'm going to put it up there in First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. He says, "For the love of," and he's talking about money here. Now, he's not saying money is evil. He says the love of money. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that sa some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs okay so that's that's a warning paul also gives when a church's love for christ is replaced by and next i know paul is saying the love for money here but i think it can be anything else if your love is replaced by anything else other than christ then that is the direction it will go it's a direction of wandering away and i'm not in the church in general that loses that Love for Christ is the center point of everything. And we'll get to the seventh church, Laodicea, where Christ is not even in the church. He's standing outside the church. Where, um, where they've wandered away from the love for Christ, that that church can move away from, from, from the faith because of their love for other things. And, um, and people's love for the things of the world will lead to wandering away from the faith. And, and, and let's be honest. Money is not the problem. It's the people's love for money. And we, I've seen this through all the years in the church, through, through all my ministry, 20 years ministry. I've seen people where their love for money became the reason why their love grew cold and they, they don't attend church anymore. They don't come to church anymore. They've got other things and so many other things. And I've, I've, I'm, I've seen this, 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 what Paul is warning here, I've seen it. And, um, and it's always a concern when I, when I see the, when I see people on that road and, um, I don't know always how to, to rebuke them or how to help them or to reproach them, but, but it's a fact. It, it just happens. And Jesus said, you cannot, Jesus even said, you cannot love your father or your mother more than you love him. Matthew chapter 10 verse 37. And if a church finds itself in, in a church in general, I'm talking church in general, finds its, it, it, itself in that position, what must the church do? And I think the message to the, to the leader of that church, what must, what must they do? What, what's the sermon? What's the, what's the word, the message that he should give to that church? And hopefully it's not the leader who's corrupted, but uh, mostly it probably comes starts with the leader sometimes most of the times but um what is that message what what does jesus say to that church and this is the message that jesus gives to uh the church of ephesus he commends them for the for their endurance for their faithfulness for keeping the sound doctrine and not not living uh, evil lifestyles he's commending them for that but the danger is their love for Christ grew cold, and that's the danger. And this is the command he gives them, verse, verse 5. Um, he gives them three things to do, three, three steps. Let's call it step three steps. The first one is remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. And I think that's the first thing that a church should, should be reminded where they, where they come from where they were and what happened where did they fall where, what happened what time i don't know obviously every church is different but at what stage did things go wrong and um, they should first remember where they have fallen go back to that place where the direction completely went off track um, and for the church of ephesus they must remember the love they once had for Christ. Remember where you are from. And I, I do, when, when, I, when I also talk to, to, to or counsel someone individually or talk to someone individually about, about their, their life and things that might have gone wrong through their, their Christian life, that's also something I normally do is 
tell me about your salvation. What happened? When did when you got saved? What did Jesus do for you? How did you feel? What was your relationship at that stage? Remember where you come from. Remember that affection, that love. I know when I got saved, I felt new. I felt clean. I felt the love of Christ overwhelming me. Uh, I was 15 years old. And sometimes it's, it's always good to remind yourself what happened and that love you had for Christ. I don't know if you remember when you got saved, um, what passion you had, the passion you had for Christ and for the church, that zeal you had. The question is, it's, is it still there? Is that burning, um, what's your after word? Desire, not that passion you had. Let me see, John, you, you asked something. Is the church or the individual being referred to in Timothy? If the individual departing from the faith, no. Now, I, uh, Timothy, I don't think it refers to individual. Let me quickly go back there. Uh, what was it, Timothy? For the love of money is root of all evil kinds of evil it is through this craving that some have wandered away i don't think he's he's specifying i don't think it's it's believers that wandered away from the faith the faith meaning they did they they left the christian faith um i think it's doesn't and, and we know from my understanding from from um what the bible teach about your salvation is when you are truly saved, when you have faith, your faith will endure until the end. Your faith will, um, it, you will never leave. In fact, First John chapter 2, John says, those who went out from us were never of us because if they were of us, they would have stayed. They, would have never, they wouldn't have left. So maybe that's a proof of the pudding, if I can use that word. It's the proof of or if, if someone is truly saved or not. So I don't know if that answers your question, John, or did you? It does, and it was it was a sort of a loaded question because um, it's the way I see it as well. Okay. Uh, I've always used the expression that if somebody, um, like he says, Demas has forsaken us, but he never was one of us. So I, you know, I, I believe in the fact that you know once you are truly born again, it's sealed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So so I do I do I do agree. 100% or let's say 99.9%. I'm going to say why that 1.1% because I don't think Demas lost his salvation. I'm going to say why. It's just a different interpretation. I don't think Demas, Demas left Christ. It says he left the ministry and he went back to a, a secular work. Okay. So I don't think he left his, 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 his faith. That's just my opinion. I don't know. So, but he, okay. I, do, no problem. I do believe Demas was saved and was still saved. Even then he went away, he was with Paul uh, ministering, but he left that ministry and he went back to the world because he loved his yeah. world. I don't know. If, if that's, uh, that's just okay. another. No, that's... <laughs> okay, but otherwise, I, I agree completely that when you're truly born again, there's no way you can apart, uh, depart from the faith. I, if you depart from the faith, you never had it. That, that's my opinion. That's, or not my opinion, that's yeah. what I believe the Bible teaches. Um, okay, thanks. Maria, you says the NIV commentary explains lampstand nicely. Okay, please explain it to us. Lizelle, you have a NIV. Tell us, what does it say? What does it say, lampstand? Uh, Maria, do you want to share that with us? Or should we continue and then at the end if you... Have a different kind of view from that. Yeah, let me. Yes. Okay. Um, for Jesus to remove your lampstand from its place would mean the church would cease to be an effective church. That's Just it. Just as the seven candlestick in the temple gave lights for the priests to see, exactly. the churches will give light to, yeah. that sur to their surrounding communities. But Jesus warned them that their lights could go out. In fact, Jesus himself would extinguish any light that did not fulfill its purpose. Okay. The I church agree. had to repent of its sins. Okay, I agree. I agree with that. I was just saying the test testimony, the way they shine the light that was removed. So they don't they don't reflect Christ's light anymore. Um, 
I don't want my notes to go down. Okay, so I think that's, I think I agree with that commentary. Um, that's basically, it's not, it's not the believer that is removed and now is unsaved. It is the church, the testimony, the light they shine that is removed. They're not shining the light anymore. They're not a testimony for, for Jesus. They, as you say, they're not effective anymore. They, they don't shine Christ's light anymore. So I agree completely with that. Um, let me continue also as Bay with a fast faith. Let me just get that up there. Verse five. Okay. The, Jesus gives that warning. He says, if not, if they don't do, oh, well, there are three things. We were talking about the first one, remember. The second one is repent. Obviously, repentance is the word metanoia, to change your mind, to change your attitude towards Christ. Uh, so you need to remember, you need to repent. And also, the um, you know, repentance, reclaiming your love that you had for him. And then step the third step was do the works you did at first. Do the works you did at first. Not saying that you must do works now to be, obviously be saved. It's, it's just saying that that true love for God will always manifest in the works that it produces. So true love for God will then manifest itself in the works you do. So if a church does not obey Christ in these things, they could experience, expect sudden judgment. We spoke about the judgment stand at the beginning at the house of old of God. They can expect that judgment from him. Um, <clears throat> and uh, obviously the removal. And this is what happened. This is what happened to the church of Ephesus. It's sad, but true. The church of Ephesus, although the church continued for centuries, seven, several centuries, the church as a testimony kind of was removed. They, they, wouldn't, they weren't testifying for Christ anymore. They were removed. They didn't shine their light anymore. They were not effective. The words that the NIV used, their lampstand was, was removed. Now, it's interesting if you go and read about the church of Ephesus, they retained its vigor for several centuries and was not only the seat of eastern bishops but also the meeting place for the church where the third general council took place in 431 a.d that's just a little bit of history there but i don't think they were a lampstand stand for jesus anymore because they didn't shine the light of christ and the sounds like the charismatics <laughs> okay that's a different topic yes so the city of Ephesus, interesting if you go and read it, it's where Turkey is today, modern day Turkey. The city of Ephesus, I've got a map here, I'll show you now when we look at Smyrna maybe. The city of Ephesus became uninhabited. They actually uh, took the people away in the 14th, 14th century. Uh, it was just not livable anymore. Now, if you go to Revelation 2 verse 6, it says, Yet this you have. And again, he commends them. He says, you have this. You hate the works of Nicolaitans. And uh, it might, might be connected with the first commendation with moral living and with sound doctrine. And the Nicolaitans didn't have those two things. And which, in fact, Jesus says, I also hate. Now, I would say the works. He hates the works. It's not saying he hates people. I do believe Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for the world. And he died for us while we were sinners. And, but he hates the works of the Nicolaitans. And, and this is also true of what Jesus is say, saying. So again, they're commended hating the enemies of truth. Not, not, not the enemies, obviously the works of the enemies. And there's much speculation about, the, and as we said about the Nicolaitans, we don't know. Interestingly, Nicolaitan comes from two words. Mm. It comes from the word Nike, Nike. You have Nike Takis. Oh my word. Okay, I didn't know my brother Niku. His name comes from Nike. Is yep. It? Yep, it does. So Nike means victory or conqueror. Okay. Uh, that's where the Taki comes from. Nike, mm. uh, victory, the brand, yeah. Yeah, the brand. And the second part, Lightens, comes from Laos. We also Laodicea. We'll get to that 
same word, laos meaning people. So they were conquering the people. They would, and in fact, the, in, in the context, they were destroying people, okay, their lives. In, and uh, in the letter to the church of Pergamos, if you go down to chapter, uh, in chapter 2 to verse 12, we also find it again with the church of Pergamos, where it says, um, let, let me read it. I've got, got it here. Verse 14 and 15. It says, but I have a few things against you. This is the church of Pergamos. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. And then it's 15. So also you have some who hold to the teachings of Nicolaitans. So he, 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 the church of Pergamos obviously had the same problem. They were holding on to the teaching. So that was a false teaching, basically. Um, I would think maybe it had something to do with the Gnostics because that was the, the era of the early church. And um, they were holding on to that. And then verse 7 says, he who has, let me go down, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, who are those who conquer? Who are those who conquer? First um, John chapter 5, verse 1. Do I have that? No, I don't have it. First John chapter 5, verse 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So, in other words, those who conquer in, yeah, here in, in chapter 2, obviously are those that obey Jesus' command. They repent. They have their love for Christ. They conquer. They overcome the unbelief and sin of the world. They overcome the world as promised, and they will also have the right to the tree of life. We will find that also in Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. The tree of life, or first mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, 22, Adam and Eve were kicked out. They didn't have any access to the tree of life. But now in Revelation 22, we will also have um, eat from the tree of life. What it all mean? means i don't know i don't know if we will die if we don't eat from the tree of life i don't know i don't know um we will probably when we get there have the discussion around this and i'll read on on the issue but this promise is designed the promise that jesus gives to this church when they have a ear when they listen to what the spirit says they will conquer this promise is there given to them to restore and rekindle their love for the church, some, some, uh, for what they had for Christ in the early days, to rekindle the church. I think, in general, the church to rekindle As and restore that this promise, obviously, so that individuals can respond positively and and repent and remember. But I think the the responsibility also lies with the leaders who uh, had the responsibility to give this message to the church. And, and and bring this church back to where it's supposed to be. Obviously, 30 years later, later on, Ephesus didn't happen. Now, the lesson. Let's let's talk about the lesson application for us. I, I, I was just thinking when I read this, I was thinking of Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary. Maybe someone can um, help me here. Yeah? Martha and Mary, the one. One worked very hard. The other one sat at the Jesus, the Jesus feet. So this is what was going through my mind when I read this. I was thinking, you know, it's good. Both these two things are necessary. We should live lives that are pleasing towards God. We should have sound doctrine. But the danger is that, and I've seen this in the church over years, that one can become so so doctrinally sound that you become grumpy and and unapproachable. unapproachable and unloving towards those who don't obviously follow what you believe. And sound doctrine has that 
danger with not sound doctrine in itself, but it has that danger because we are human beings and sinful hearts that it, we can become spiritually apathetic. Apathetic. That word. Did it have to work? I hope so. Yeah, I hope you understand what I'm saying. That you can become really. Um, yeah, we, we, I think there must be a balance between sound doctrine and love. There must be a balance between Mary and Martha. That's, that's what was going through my mind. I don't, maybe someone can help me clear some up there. Aubrey, do you have something to add there, please? Oh, Rudy, it, it, seem, excuse me, it seems like um, it was actually poor leadership that caused the church after Paul laying such a good foundation mm. that it now then goes into, I don't know if the, the word apostasy is the right thing, but all the teaching that Paul gave them has now dropped to one side, which is perhaps why the letter was actually um, addressed to the leader or the messenger. Yeah. Could I yeah. be right there? Yeah, I think the, obviously the leaders or leader that was responsible in that stage for the church, they, they had the responsibility um, to preach the, 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 uh, the, the correct message. The news, to the church. Yeah. But, but what, mm. I, what I'm trying to say is, is we should be careful that we okay. can become so doctrinally sound that we, love, we, we forget yes. about no the good. love for, for Christ. And, and I think churches, maybe I'm just putting a, trying to, to sketch a problem because I've seen it in churches. I don't know how to put it in words. I've seen churches that, mm. that, that yeah. only fall oh, on one that. side. They've got the doctrines right. They've like Ephesus. But when it comes to worship and love for Christ and loving other people, they become so, so uh, uninvolved in people's lives. They, it's only about truth, about doctrine. It's only about you, you're not allowed to sin. It becomes a, kind of a very legal thing, legalistic thing. But, but when it comes, and then you have churches that fall the other way. They don't want the doctrine. They don't want sound doctrine. Oh, but it's all about love. It's all about love. And they love people and they care for people and do all these wonderful works. That is also good. I think what, what I read from this is we need both. We need both. We need sound doctrine. We need to talk, we need to preach about moral living. We need to preach about sin and the consequences of sin. These things are important. We need to, to not, we, we cannot tolerate sin in our lives and in the church. We cannot tolerate any false doctrine. But the other side is also true. And I think there's actually not two sides. It's the same, it should go together. We should love our brothers. We should love Christ with all of them. We should have that passion and love for Jesus. And I think both is important. So I don't know if, if that idea sits with you or, or you have anything to add there, but, but that's kind of the thing that was going in my heart when I read this. Yes, we need to sound doctrine, but we must be careful that we lose our love for Christ or we grow cold in our love for Christ or, or grow cold in our love for one another and our brothers and sisters. So that's just what, what I was thinking about when I kind of uh, prepared this. So John, I don't know, you unmuted yourself. Do you have something? No, well, I'm just going to, we, we used to have an expression. <laughs> sorry, no, my sorry. dogs are playing while I'm <laughs> don't um, we, we had an expression that used to say that some people became so heavenly minded that they became no of no earthly good. Yes. In other words, because of this, such a focus on the all of the spiritual, which, as you correctly said, is important. But it was so big that they actually repelled people. Instead of drawing people to Christ through love, they yeah. would hammer them with the Bible and the word. And it was, they that, became of no value on earth. No, that's the danger. That's what I'm saying. That's the issue that I can see that comes from this portion of scripture is that this is the warning I r read from this. Although... I do believe, uh, hopefully, we can also be commended as a church for, 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 for sound doctrine and for preaching about morals and, uh, and, and uh, living um, holy lives. I do believe in that and I preach that and hopefully that's the message that the church gets. 
but it's also important that we preach love. And we've been doing this the last few weeks with, obviously with first John, it's just been hammering that thing. And, and I think John knows exactly what he's, when he he's wrote this letter to this church through the inspiration of the spirit, that that's a danger. If we don't love one another, it's a, we need to be reminded over and over again. We need to express the love of God to our brothers and sisters. And that means not just saying, saying it, it means getting involved in people's life, caring for one another, looking at one another's needs and, um, and showing that love of Christ and be passionate. And in fact, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a church where we have all the doctrines hundred percent correct from A to Z, but we, we so, what, what's it, the chosen frozen. I don't, that's one expression I've heard from church. We so chosen frozen also so, so coat geword. And I've, I know people about, I know, actually, no, I can name them. I, I won't name names. Not, you don't know them. It's from another town that I know them. They so, so doctrinally minded about the correctness of their theology that at the end, they have no way to show relationship. They so <laughs> heavenly minded, if I can use that word. So we must be very careful. I think it's both. We, we must pursue sound rock doctrine, moral living, all those things. But we must also pursue the love of Christ and the passion and affection he has for us to show that to others. And I think Jesus said at once, uh, I'm thinking about Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus said this. For, for, oh, no, no, I think sorry, it's 4 verse 19. He says, learn from me. Oh, no, no, it's not learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And that's one of the one of, one of the characteristics that we need, as a church 11. need to, to, to want. It's Matthew eleven twenty nine. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Okay, Cynthia, you have, have something to add? Yeah, really. You started touching on. I was just going to say, there's a saying about being so earth, so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. Yes. <laughs> yes, John. John yeah. said that. Yeah. But, well, yeah. We, uh, we, we, must be, we must be very careful. Yes, we need sound doctrine, but not to the expense of the love for other brothers. Uh, and I'm not playing the one against the other. I think both must be together. If you don't have sound doctrine, you only have love, 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 then you fall into this category of, of works, working, walking on the soft paths. Just, it's, it's love that is selfish kind of thing. I just want to have good relationship with everyone and it doesn't matter what the truth is. I don't care about the truth as long as I love you and you love me kind of thing. It comes kind of a very new age thing. But if, if we only have doctrine and all those things, it can become so hard headed and so stubborn or, I don't know what's a word I can gebruik in English, cold towards other people. I think they must be together. And that's what I think this message is from this church that Christ wants for us. Okay, the Lowe family's got a hand up. One of the five or six of you listening, you can talk. <laughs> we are seven, like the seven candles. <laughs> yes. well, one of you must be removed now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Definitely not. Um, Yes, I, I agree. You, you know, what you're saying is, is we should have love and good doctrine. It's the balance of love and faith. Yes. But, but the one problem with that saying about being so heavenly minded that you have no earthly use, it, it can be interpreted that Christians must be a little bit worldly as well. Yeah, no, which I, don't I think, think that, is the wrong interpretation. The, yeah, no, I don't the think issues, we must be 100% for Christ. But but both in love and in faith. Yeah. No, I, th I don't think that and, was and another saying, intention at all. I think it yeah. was, we all understand what it means. Yes. Uh, another way to say it is to say that, that if you're truly in love with heaven, you will be truly useful on earth. Maybe. Yeah, I like that statement. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Thanks for that. Thanks for... Aubrey, you still unmuted. Did you want to say something? 
No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgive you, Aubrey. Rudy, I, I did. Yes. Um, in, in terms of um, being of earthly use and loving each other and stuff, sometimes, and, and I think this is why it's so important that it's the whole church together, is that the needs of the earth and, and what we experience down here can wear you out. Because it's almost insatiable. Yeah. And you, you get tired. And I think sometimes that's why the, the love cools down or gets cold. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that's why we need each other. Because we need to be able to go to each other for refreshing. And we need to for encouragement. And for so others to stand up when others sit down. Yes. And to, to work together as a body. Okay, so um, you, you just opened my thoughts now. I'm going to read the scripture to you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it's in Hebrew chapter 10. Let me read that. I'll share my screen there. Let's see if I can be, make it bigger. I just have to look for that scripture. Um, Okay, I think it's this one, verse 23, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. I'll say that is doctrine. That's the confession, what, what we believe, without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So I would put that in the category of, of, of doctrine. To confess our hope. What do we believe? Um, and then the next verse he says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That's the second part. Okay, so thanks for, for uh, pointing me. Maybe the Holy Spirit prompted me to share this. Because we need to Stir one another up in love and good works. And as we mekaar moeg maak, moet ons mekaar moeg maak met dit. But we have to stir one another. And how do we do this? How do we do this? We, we actually spoke on this this morning in the ladies. Okay, Lizelle, yeah. Um, and the good deeds that are, are required of us. And it's interesting, he referred, she referred to, to Hebrews, where Jesus, as our high priest, he sat down at the right hand of the Father when the work was done. We don't get to sit down yet because our work is not done. And yeah. John says, as long as it's day, let us work. And um, in, I think it's in 1 Peter, he says to the church, I'm, I'm not sure I'm trying to find that one, um, where the church needs to equip us for good works. Yes. Okay, so let me continue. Great, I fancy. Uh, it says, let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds. How do we do this? 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day draw near mm -hmm. so it's such an important thing you cannot neglect the coming together of believers mm -hmm. that's where i've seen through the years where people grow cold in their hearts they start neglecting the coming together Let's talk about church meetings and maybe a Bible study here or there. And it becomes less and less and less. It becomes a habit. Maybe once a month I would not go to church. Then it becomes twice a month. Then it becomes once a month that I go to church. Maybe when we have communion. And it just becomes this habit. And in that, we are not. We need to understand that coming together, when we meet together as church, is not just about singing and listening to a sermon it's about encouraging one another ministering to one another looking people in the face seeing people other brothers and sisters and say hey how are you doing what can i pray for what are you doing let's stir one another in love and good deeds that i believe is what church is about and if if people start uh, we uh, the pastor that i was used um was in Rustenburg with, he, he had this expression always. He said, some people have a knit, one slip, one 
attitude. Net one, slip one. You know, net one goat is when you heckle under yeah. the heckle, net one, you, slip. Net, Some yeah. people think about shirts like that. They net one, slip one <laughs> kind of way. I don't think that, uh, maybe I'm just a different makeup. I don't know why I'm different because since I've been 15 years old when the Lord saved me, since then I wanted to, I wanted to be at church every, even during exams, even when we were writing my matric exam, I made my parents take me to church because I wanted to be part of the body of Christ. And I understand not everyone uh, is different. We're not the same, but I do believe that we need not to, we, we shouldn't neglect those times that we have where obviously online it's not the best, but these times are so important when we come together, where we share with one another, where we encourage one another, where we can, can, can pray for one another. It's so important and we should never, never neglect this. Never. Um, so yeah, let, that's, that's what I wanted to add there. But it, yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's where, it's where um, he says some are, are teachers and some are prophets and, yeah, I think you think about Ephesians chapter six. Okay, but or, or chapter four. Mm. Okay, um, that's that's about the first church, the church of Ephesus that we were talking about. Now, mm. maybe what's the time? Twenty past eight. Yes, the church is to prepare God's people for work yeah. and service. So let me read that for for them, and I think four. we should maybe do Smyrna next week. Otherwise, it's going to not, not have enough time. So let me read if Ephesians, Ephesians, 4, 11 to 12. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. It kind of okay, I'll share my screen. Let me share the screen. This one. Okay, um, Ephesians chapter 4, we all know the scripture. Um, he talks about verse 11. He gave the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. And their work is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, I love this verse because it says to me that I don't have to do everything in the church. You've got the tough job. You I've got the tough course. job to equip the saints, but for whose work? for their work of ministry. They need to do the ministry. And I think the church in, in general, uh, all the churches that I've been involved through the years and been part of, we, we this is a tough one. This is really a tough one. And we a lot of churches can probably say the same thing, that we struggle to get people to, to be involved and be part of work and ministry until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature man into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's, that's the way we need to go. That's the way that's planned for us, that God has planned for us. That's the way to mature, maturity, is to equip the saints for ministry and so that they can also be involved. So hopefully that encourages you tonight and also stir you tonight into love and good deeds. Um, I'm thankful for the ladies who want to start with a soup kitchen next week, Wednesday. Okay, so for those who are online, let me just, maybe you're the first people to hear this. We will put the message out on the group and also on on, on Sunday at the church. That's Sun Wednesday. So if you know anyone in the area close to the church who, who um, wants to come, uh, who has a need, please let the word go and uh, tell them about the soup kitchen that we will start next Wednesday from 12 o'clock. Yeah. From 12 o'clock lunch. Okay. I think I'm going to stop there. I'm going to give you a break tonight. We're not going to go all the way to nine o'clock. <laughs> Any last questions? Any last comments? Any thing you want to share? Nobody. Are you all good? Okay. Um, get out the and thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's then end this with a prayer.
I'm, yeah, I'll should be here for now. If I start with the Church of Smyrna, it's going to go over nine o'clock. We're not going to finish with that one. So let's just rather end it here. Go and read the Church of Smyrna. It's the suffering church from verse 8 to 11. It talks about suffering. They are commended for this, for the, the way they endured suffering and trials and, and, and those things, tribulation, and the way that Jesus encourages them by showing saying to them i know what you're going through and the way that this letter is written it's it's just good um how you can also encourage those who are going through uh, suffering and difficulty um that's smyrna smyrna also uh it's a greek word that refers to myrrh myrrh is a perfume that was used uh it was used in in the temp tabernacle where they and use it as holy anointing oil also used for bridegrooms bridegrooms used it there's actually two scriptures about this and i'll well, share that next week yeah i'm not going to say more than that and then maybe if you, any one of you want to go and read or can google that or have a book on it uh polycarp the one of the, the martyrs in the early church that was written about through by i think the church um, early church fathers wrote about him polycarp a very interesting story uh, so you can go and read on that and we'll refer to him next week so i'm not gonna go th we're not gonna end before nine if i start now so let's rather not continue there Urs. yeah just something came to my mind now in terms of the first love which uh Another aspect could be that uh, at the beginning when I came to, to know the Lord, I, I was very much wanting to share that with other people. Mm. So that is possibly also one of the things that, that we can lose yeah 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 that that you want to go and turn the whole world upside down when you are just say mm. i know that and sometimes we do stupid things and say stupid things because we are kind of uneducated in the christian <laughs> faith at that stage we say dom goeders to people but sincerely you want you know you want to tell people about what the lord has done for you and that's why I believe also discipleship is such an important part of the church. Discipleship is where we take a new believer and, and teach him and, and journey with him through his, his, his spiritual growth to maturity. And uh, we need more disciples in the church that disciples, young, the young generation. And I think that's happy. That will happen with any church. If the church can go through a, a very high peak of of kind of spiritual revival or whatever you want to call it but that second ger generation kind of it fades away and the, and the children that is brought up they are not they kind of we neglect them and we shouldn't they, we should they should be spiritual fathers that look after the spiritual children and teach them and and help them to grow spiritually and that's kind of, those are the things that we we should address and i do believe that is what discipleship mean and what we should do as mm -hmm. as making disciples proverbs 19 2 says zeal without knowledge it, yeah yeah proverbs okay 19. you've got that scripture zeal without knowledge proverbs, proverbs, proverbs 19 verse 2 19 verse 2 that's what we all have when we just say <laughs> proverbs 19 verse to. to zeal without knowledge enthusiasm, enthusiasm. <laughs> enthusiasm. anyways let's end it here um if there's no request or nothing we still think of 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 um person esther is gonna fly friday evening. friday evening and uh may you have a good trip may there not be no hiccups and uh, struggles hopefully you're not in quarantine that side <laughs> and enjoy well, according it. according to the information we are not okay hopefully let's hope so and enjoy it enjoy it be safe take
take care. We'll probably Thank see you. you still logging in on, on, online. Are you going to still log in on church services and also the Bible studies? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes, just I hope that you get the time difference right. So you log in and nobody's there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's pray. Let's let's end with prayer. Father, thank you for this time that we could share. Thank you for the word. And Lord, there's one thing that you desire for us. It is a, to be a church that that is the carrier of the truth, that holds the truth, that preaches the truth, that um, that rightly divides the word of truth as um, servants that are not be to that are not to be ashamed of of how we treat your word and how we preach your word and how we share the word of God. Help us, Lord, also to to not be not be um, tolerant when it comes to sinful practices and, and and moral issues. That we will not tolerate it. That we will will seek um, holy living and lives that please you. But more than that, as we've listened to this um, this 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 letter that was written to this church, that we will not forsake that love that we have for you, and that we will hold on to that love. That we will we will pursue to love you more this relationship it's not just being know, knowing the truth but it's also being in that relationship with you in, and that intimate relationship we have with you so that we can grow in our love for you and also for the church lord that is what we desire and thank you for this word that encourages us that that um also helps us to see the the spiritual need in our own lives and also in the church and help us, Lord, to, to, to adhere to your words, to, to follow your instructions. And, and, Lord, so that we will be a church that will shine your light in this world. And that our love for one another will be a testimony to the world that we are truly sons and daughters of the living God. We just worship you. We give you all the praise and honor for that. And um, I pray for everyone in our church, for all our members. Lord, that you will also revive in us your for, uh, rekindle in us your love towards one another and, and towards you so that we can be a, a light that shines in a dark place because our, the world around us is dark, the world around us is selfish, uh, people destroy one another and Lord, we don't want to be in uh, part of this world. We, Although we're in this world, we are not of this world. And help us, Lord, to make a difference in our communities, in, in the place we live people around us, our neighbors, our friends, our family, everywhere we go, that we may show the love of Christ and manifest your love in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay, God bless you all.